once around series. I was fascinated when I read Sir Patrick Moore's book back in the 1960s and discovered that there was another world orbiting in the solar system that I'd never heard of. And I've been interested in series ever since. The story goes back to Johannes Kepler and his Mysterium Cosmographicum publication, in which he wrote, Between Mars and Jupiter, I place a planet. This was all based on the idea of mapping the solar system and the distances from the sun to the planets by the analogy with the platonic solids, the tetrahedron, cube, dodecahedron, sphere, etc., and placing these one inside the other, nesting them in the right order, you could make them fit together such that the characteristic distances for the sizes of the various solids matched the orbits of the known planets, except for the fact that there was a problem. There was a gap between Mars and Jupiter where one of the solids had to be placed where there was no known planet. So this led Kepler to the idea that there was a planet yet to be discovered, planet number five. And he wasn't the only person to, to think this. Titus and later Bode, who picked up the idea, worked out that there was a rule of thumb mathematical formula that involved starting from Mercury and adding a constant multiplied by a power of two, and you could easily get a map of the distances of the known planets, again, having to skip over one between Mars and Jupiter. So here's the maths. You start with 0 0.4, which is the distance of Mercury, and you add 0 0.3 to it times a number which goes 0, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, doubling at each step, uh, except for the first one, of course, which is a bit of a cheat. But it produces 0 0.4, 0 0.7, 1.0 for Earth, 1.6 for Mars. Then it produces 2.8, where there is no planet, and then 5.2 for Jupiter, and it produces 10 for Saturn. Well, that's not quite right for Saturn. It should really be 9.6, but it's close. And so this was intriguing as indicating that there was some structure and organization to the distances of the planets in the solar system. And then along came Sir William Herschel with his discovery of Uranus. He was observing, looking for double stars from his backyard at his home in Bath in England, and he spotted a moving disc-like object, which he reported to the Royal Astronomical Society as a new comet. But more observations and calculations of its orbit showed that it wasn't behaving like a comet. It had no tail, but it was orbiting in a near circular orbit, 19.2 astronomical units from the sun, nearly double the distance that Saturn was. And it was soon realized that this was, in fact, a new planet that had been discovered, the planet Uranus. And if you plug in the numbers into Bode's law, you get 19.6. You get 0 0.4 plus 0 0.3 times the next number, 64 in the sequence. And that's a pretty good fit for 19.2. In fact, it's a better fit than the previous prediction of Saturn would have been. So everybody thought, wow, we've got a law here that is predictive rather than just having been fitted to the known data. And this led to people wondering what was going on at 2.8 astronomical units. And a group called the Celestial Police was put together comprising many famous astronomers from all over Europe, including Neville Maskelyne, the British Royal Astronomer, and other luminaries, to hunt down this missing planet number five in the Mars-Jupiter gap. Well, that was in 1800. They got scooped on the 1st of January, 1801, by this guy, Giuseppe Piazzi, and he found a moving point of light he thought originally he'd found a comet, but by the 24th of January, he checked its movement and said that it was going so slowly and in a uniform manner that he thought it probably wasn't a comet. And he was right. 
The mathematician Gauss had recently invented a new way of calculating orbits from just three observations and soon showed that this object was right at 2.8 astronomical units, just where the Titus Bode law had predicted it. And so Piazzi had found a new planet. Now, he suggested the name uh, Ceres Fernandia after the king of Sicily. I think he wanted to become royal astronomer. Um, actually, Herschel tried the same trick. He tried to name Uranus after King George, but that didn't work. And it didn't work here either in that the Fernandia part was dropped and the name Ceres was adopted after the Roman god of the harvest. And it was deemed to be a new planet and assigned a planetary symbol that you can see at the top right there and listed as a new planet for about 50 years. It was orbit was right where it was predicted going around the sun in a nearly circular but somewhat eccentric orbit, tilted at about 10 degrees to the solar system plane, so not extreme, but uh, slightly unusual for a planet. Um, perhaps that's why it hadn't been seen before, because it uh, wandered away from the ecliptic plane um, of the orbit of all the other planets so much. Well, the other interesting thing about this is that it does seem to be somehow related to Mars because the orbits are such that Mars has its perihelion, its close approach on the opposite side to Ceres. Um, and that seems to be true for some of the other main asteroids, probably due to interactions with Mars's gravity. But it wasn't long before others were found. Three more, Juno, Pas Pallas and Vesta, were soon tracked down over the next few years. And of those, Pallas, along with Ceres, was in the 2.77 AU, right where I expected. Juno a little closer at 2.67, and Vesta, well, 2.36, somewhat out of that exact match, but uh, still orbiting around together. And these were all deemed to be planets. But no matter what uh, new telescopes were turned to them, they never showed a disk. They always seemed to be star-like, points of light. And so Sir William Herschel came up with the term asteroid, meaning like a star. Um, and they all got classified as asteroids for the next 150 years. Frustrating that these little tiny things that should have been planets just refused to show any disk at all. And they are quite small. Ceres is the largest of them, 950 kilometers in diameter, 600 miles. Um, and you can see it to scale there with the moon and Earth. So you can see it's rather small. It's much smaller than the moon. But it, and it on its own, contains a third of the mass of all of the known asteroids. So it's by far the largest of them as well. This is a Hubble Space Telescope picture of it. It's uh, generally too faint to spot with the naked eye. You can find it with binoculars as a tiny little point. But as I've said, until we had uh, telescopes of the capability of Hubble, we couldn't really get any details at all. You can see this color image, a little bit fuzzy, not very many pixels in it, and a slight hint of a white spot at the top there. We've got a series of black and white pictures here showing that white spot and showing it moving as the uh, little world rotates on its axis. And it was hypothesized that this was frost on the surface and that even there might be a tenuous atmosphere just managing to stick around in the uh, relatively cool temperature. So the maximum temperature on Ceres, minus 38 degrees, but it gets very, very cold at the poles and in the shadows in the bottom of the deep craters where the sun never shines. So an interesting little world, classed as an asteroid after 50 years of being a planet, but the question was revisited in 2006. The astronomical community, the IAU, debated what to do about our definition of the word planet. The Greeks had meant wanderer, and had included the moon and the sun as planets. We no longer used that. But with the discovery of 2003 UB313, now called Albion by Dave Jewett and Jane Liu, out there in the Kuiper Belt, opening the floodgates on finding more objects out beyond Pluto, 
it was getting difficult to really know how many planets we had in the solar system and whether we were going to end up with dozens of them with the discovery of things like Eris that seemed to be on a par with Pluto in terms of size. So should we call that a planet? And it was realized that we really didn't have a definition. One definition that was proposed by the IAU originally was that the object needed to be massive enough for its self-gravity to pull it round, needed to orbit a star and not be a star or in orbit round another planet. And that would have made Ceres the fifth planet from the sun because it would have fitted all of those criteria. But so would a lot of other objects. Pluto, of course, Eris, many of the Kuiper Belt objects, and indeed some of the other objects in the asteroid belt would just about have been uh, candidates for that as well. So a definition had to be chosen, and they went for one that excluded Ceres and Pluto, demoting them to dwarf planet status, or in Ceres' case, perhaps promoting it from an asteroid up to being a dwarf planet. So that's where we are at the moment. The story then continues because in 2007, the Dawn space prior was launched to go to the asteroid belt and visit Vesta and Ceres. It arrived at Vesta, stayed a year from 2011 to 2012, making excellent uh, detailed maps of the surface and carrying out various spectroscopy and science experiments, and then flew on, relighting its uh, ion engines, and flew to Ceres and went into orbit there in 2015, where it remains. It now has no fuel left, so it can't go anywhere else, unfortunately. That would have been far too good. So what did it find? Well, as it approached Ceres, it confirmed the existence of those white spots, but they were much smaller and more intense than the rather blurry distant images had shown. It confirmed the spherical shape, squeezing itself into a nice round little world, um, more so than any of the other asteroids. But the real surprise was those spots. Right in the center of what's called the Okata Crater, these strange white features were seen. And as this color photograph from yet closer shows, we're beginning to get more detail and show that there is structure within those spots. Here's an oblique picture taken on a flyby of the large crater with those white regions in the center. And gradually the orbit was lowered and we got some very close flybys with this shot of those white spots showing cracks and grooves in the ground reminiscent of those on other ice worlds like Europa and these strange heaps of white material that seem to have been deposited somehow. Well, a color photograph revealed that there is something going on here, and this was analyzed with a spectroscope and shown to be a mixture of salts, so sodium chloride, uh, magnesium, calcium, Epsom salts, all sorts of things that had obviously been brought to the surface Here's an oblique view of that spot, central rise there, being colorized somewhat to reveal the different chemicals present um, within the eruption of material coming from underneath. And this is believed to have been a briny, salty ocean of water pushing its way to the surface and then the water subliming out into space and leaving behind all of the salts on the surface. In fact, we've seen this cryo-volcano activity elsewhere on Ceres. These uh, low temperature volcanoes have produced things like this ice mountain, where there is some upthrust coming up, taking the dusty surface up on top, but the bright white ice being revealed. And this is because Ceres turns out to be very rich in water. This is a spectrographic map of the water content according to uh, the different parts of the surface of Ceres. It's actually mapping hydrogen, but that is a very, very good proxy for hydration in the minerals and a lot of water. And what it shows is that particularly at the poles, there is a very large amount of water trapped there. 
And in fact, we've since this uh, image was created, detected plumes of water being erupted from some of that cryovolcanic activity. And it's a real mystery as to what is powering the activity, the geological processes within the core of Ceres. It should be small enough to have cooled down and solidified completely. So there should not be any further geological activity. This is perhaps indicative of the fact that it might have undergone some more recent uh, reorganization. Maybe there was a giant impact and we haven't uh, detected the signs of that on the surface there. We just don't quite understand this one. But it looks like from the spectroscopy and the magnetometer readings and those spots that the structure is that there is a rocky inner core with a water ice layer over the top of it and then the th thin, dusty outer crust covering over. And this perhaps explains the uh, water being erupted to the surface and why the craters all look to be somewhat in soft focus, uh, because they're made of ice rather than being made of much firmer rock. And just to wrap up, I've got one final shot for you, which is a 3D picture taken constructed from the flyby data of Ceres within the floor of that Okata crater where all those white spots are erupting. And so I'll leave it there, but Ceres, a fascinating little world. And even though we have flown a probe there, we've still not landed. And it would be really interesting to get a lander down onto the surface, ideally a rover, and drive around on this fascinating little dwarf planet out there in the asteroid belt. Thanks very much.